Welcome everyone. My name is Lily Slavin. I am one of the Charge Syndrome Foundation board members, and I'm excited to be hosting one of our Ask the Experts sessions tonight with Dr. Lauren Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman is going to be presenting on physical education, sports, and recreation. And if you haven't heard her speak already. She is wonderful. So we are in for a great treat today. These, um, th these sessions are hosted about once a month and we bring in different experts in our field. Um, and so what will happen is Dr. Lieberman will present for about 40 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A section of the uh, of of Zoom. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Lily, for getting everything together. I really appreciate all your hard work. I know it's not easy, and uh, thank you everybody for coming. I know these are really busy times, so it's great to have you here. And let's see. So just a little bit about me. I've been working with children with charge syndrome since 1988 when I first started at Perkins. So now I'm teaching at SUNY Brockport. I'm a, I'm a distinguished service professor in the kinesiology department. I'm also the co-director of the Institute on Movement Studies for Individuals with Visual Impairment. And I teach adapted physical education. I got all my degrees in adapted physical education and that's what I teach. And my focus has been always on children with visual impairments and children who are deaf blind. I found, founded Camp Abilities in 1996. I still run the camp in Brockport and we have Camp Abilities all over the world for children with visual impairments and deaf blindness. I've written 23 books and I have 200 something peer reviewed articles. And I've been working with the Charge Foundation since 1995 after I finished my doctorate in Oregon. And that was my first conference was 1995. And I've been with the foundation ever since. And uh, it's just really a pleasure to be here. And I love working with, with kids with CHARGE syndrome. And the pictures here are, are uh, me and one of our kids from the CHARGE conference. And then my colleague, Dr. Pamela Beach with another youngster from the CHARGE conference. So the Institute that we run, and by the way, this picture was two CHARGE conferences ago with all our students with uh, the sign for our institute because we were doing some research and we were giving equipment away to all the families. But the pillars to our institute are education, doing workshops and trainings like this, leadership by bringing students to conferences and having them do research and write grants with us, teaching them how to become professionals in the field and becoming leaders. One of the pillars is programming. So for example, camp abilities, also, if anybody's from Western New York, I'm having a one day program for kids with moderate and severe disabilities at the School for the Deaf in Buffalo, if anybody's interested in that. We do year long programming. And then of course, research. We do a lot of research related to motor skills, physical activity, physical education, inclusion, uh, attitudes, and things like that. So I just wanna kind of find out who is here. If people don't mind just in the chat, if you don't mind saying where you're from and if you're a parent, how old your child is, if you don't mind doing that. And I can't see the chat on my end. So maybe yeah, really I'll, that. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're not able to use the chat, I'm not sure if that feature is enabled, you can put it in the Q and A. I'm not seeing any, oh, there we go. We, we've got um, a parent from North Carolina to a 13 year old. We have a parent from Oregon, parent to a six year old. We have a teacher of students with visual impairments in New Hampshire. Um, I can see from the participant list, I, I, I recognize the names of a, of a couple parents. 
Um, let's see, we have another who is a parent to a 29 year old in Connecticut, who is also a physical therapist in, uh, at, at a school district. And then we have mom of a seven year old, Northern California, um, whose son receives adaptive PE. Then we have someone from California who is an intervener for an 11 year old with charge. So that's awesome. I think that's most folks ha have responded. Thank you. Every thanks for everyone for telling us a little bit about yourself. I appreciate that. And then also just think about what classes does your child have that you're working with and what other disabilities might be in that class? So I just want you to picture, and, and I'm talking predominantly about physical education, but also what kind of placements are the children that you're working with in? Because that's part of the what part of what we're going to be talking about. And so I, I know that sometimes I go to a conference and people would say, why are you here? Like I'm at a vision conference or I'm at the deaf blind international conference. And they just, people don't see that connection between physical education or physical activity and kids with sensory impairments, but it's the most important subject. And I'm going to tell you why, because in physical education, the kids can meet every component of the expanded core curriculum. But also because it's the law, physical education is a direct service, which means that it's required by law. It's not a related service like PT or OT. PT or OT speech, they're important, but they rely on the disability of the child. Direct service is for everyone. And, and also, as I said, physical education, it meets all the components of the ECC like self-determination, socialization, mobility, technology, career awareness, so many things. And also in physical education, the kids learn motor skills, hopping, skipping, jumping, throwing, catching. These are the foundational skills for everything they're gonna do in their lifetime, whether it's bowling, whether it's a club basketball, whether they're going to a fitness gym or they're going to a pool. And physical education is also the foundation of self-advocacy, also self-efficacy and self-determination. If they don't learn all the sports and recreation their peers are learning, they are not gonna be self-determined. They're not gonna have the same choices as their peers. It might not look the same, but they'll learn ultimate Frisbee and the way they learn ultimate Frisbee. Frisbee golf, they'll learn yoga, volleyball in the way that they can access that. And they'll also learn about their, how to access it and with their the way they can function. But also it changes the perceptions of, of their peers and society when the kids can get out in the community and do the same things that their peers are doing. They won't be looked down upon as someone, oh, they're gonna need help all the time. And when you see some of the videos that I'll show you, you'll see what I'm talking about, that some people, really have low expectations of kids with charge and that's not the way it should be. And so I'm gonna talk about, tonight I'm gonna to talk about assessment, placement related to physical education, programming in physical education. I'm gonna talk about how to work with paraeducators and interveners, aquatics, sport opportunities, and talk about self-advocacy and then some resources. By the way, each of these topics, I could do an hour long presentation on each of these. So if you want more, I'd be happy to come into your district or your program if that if that would be helpful because each one of these I've, I've written, as you'll see, I've written books on them. Oh, this book, uh, this is one book that I think everybody, every physical education teacher with kids with charge should have. It's called Physical Education for Children with Moderate and Severe Disabilities. It's through Human Kinetics. And it has everything in it from what types of assessments to use, even for kids with severe disabilities, how to train the paraeducators and work with paraeducators, transfers in and out of the wheelchair, and just a lot of really great information. So just about assessment, and I know that most of the people here are parents, but this is something you can take back to your school because I don't know what teachers are using for IEPs but these are valid and reliable assessments 
for kids with moderate and severe disabilities. So you could use these. So for example, the test of gross motor development, the Brockport fitness test and the APES are the ones I'm going to talk about. So this is called the test of gross motor development and it's a validated assessment. It's validated for children with visual impairments from six to 12. You can get it through pro ed publishers and it assesses locomotor and object control skills. And again, I've done whole workshops on how to use this with kids with visual impairments and deaf blindness, but there's also ways that you can adapt the assessment to get the most valid outcomes as possible. And also it is a long test, there's 13 items, but we also validated the short version. So you can actually use three locomotor and three object control and it would still be valid. Okay, so that's again, through pro ed publishers. Now this is related to fitness and this, the Brockport fitness test is validated for children visual, with visual impairments and orthopedic impairments. It's the standards are for kids 10 to 17, but you can use it with children younger than that. And the items are the, the five fit, health, relate, health related fitness items of cardiovascular endurance, flexibility, upper body strength, abdominal strength, and body mass index. And there's variations of each component. If the child, like let's say they can't do a push-up, there's other things that they can do instead of a push-up. And so it's valid for children with intellectual disabilities, spinal cord injuries, cerebral palsy, visual impairment, congenital anomalies, and amputations. This is available through Human Kinetics, the same publishing company that had the other book. And then the APES is the Adapted Physical Education Assessment Standards. And the nice thing about the APES is that it looks at object control, locomotor, and physical fitness. So you could use one, one test, but the, but the law says that you can't just use one test in order to deem a child eligible for adapted physical education. So you would have to use this test and another test, but this is a nice test that you can use that you can use to uh, to assess kids in, in locomotor object control and fitness. So then you have your assessment, you use a valid assessment, you have your results, and then you're looking at where should the child be placed. Now. I know some parents don't even know that there's an option. And I do want you to know there's an option and you should have a say in the option. And I love this picture because this is just a group of kids in a class with their paraeducators all putting their hand in the middle and doing a cheer. Placement does matter. And so the placement, according to the law, a child with any disability can be eligible for adapted physical education, yet be placed in a general physical education class with supports if necessary. Actually, I think there's a slide on, oh, here it is. And so I, I love this picture of a little girl with charge syndrome. And I look at her and I just think there is an athlete in that body and we need to find the most potential that this child, ha child has. And the only way to do that is to put her in a placement that's gonna push her to reach her potential and so that she can feel like she's moving the way she should be. So again, there could be general physical education, maybe they need no supports. I've had kids with charge that are in general PE with no supports, but then they might be in general physical education with a paraeducator or an intervener or both, or maybe a peer tutor. And then there's a modified physical education which is beneficial in some ways, because it's smaller and the kids get paired one-to-one -one with a peer or you know, small groups. So it's an inclusive class, but it's smaller and they get more turns. It's not as noisy, it doesn't move as fast. So that's one I suggest. And then there's a self-contained class, which I know a lot of our kids do benefit from, which is just kids with disabilities, paraeducators and the adaptive PE teacher. And that's beneficial as long as they work on the general physical education curriculum. It's not okay to work on something else. Kids with charge deserve to learn what their peers learn. 
And if the teacher tells you otherwise, then they're wrong. Because if everybody else is learning a cool dance and they're doing it on the playground or they're doing it at the bus stop, our kids need to know what, what's that about? They're more marginalized when they don't know what their peers are doing. And then some kids actually benefit from a combined placement, the split placement, which I find, and in our research, we found that parents preferred because in the self-contained class, they learn the skills, they learn the rules, they learn what equipment they might need. We use it as a pre-teaching experience, but then they learn, they can apply that in their general PE or their modified PE class. And so they get the high skill development in self-contained class, and then they get more socialization in the general PE class. And, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate when a child gets both because they feel more confident when they go into that general PE class. You have to kind of time it that you're working on the unit that's coming up in the self-contained class, but it benefits everyone. And uh, I was just at a conference last week and one of the guys was saying that that's where they video the child in the self-contained class. And that's how they tell the paraeducator what to do in the general PE class because they see what the child what their expectations are from the self-contained class. And so this decision about where to be placed should be a team decision. It's not one person sitting in an office, ooh, visual impairment, deafness, ooh, I'm gonna put them in a self-contained class. It is a team decision. The parents should have a say, the physical education teacher should have a say, the PT, and when possible, the child, where do they wanna be placed? Placement shouldn't happen related to the comfort level of the PE teacher. That will come as the child is in the class. Placement is, is the placement should be, to depend upon the child's need. That's it. Okay. And I, I've gone to schools. Some of the schools don't have this placement decision-making process in place. I can help with that if anybody needs help with that. It's not easy. So now your child gets into the class, whether they're in a self-contained or they're in a general PE class, how do we make sure that they're included? And one approach I find awesome is the universal design for learning approach because they should be learning the same units as their peers. So here, this picture on the right, that's actually from two, a couple charge conferences ago with, with uh, Dr. Beth teaching Dr. Parachute. But the point is that they should be learning the same units as their peers. And so we need to make sure that there's enough variables in place. So no matter the level of the child, their ambulatory function, their speed of play, their balance, it can be taken into accommodation. So if you look at the picture here on the left, there's balance boards, there are different batting tees, different bats that they can bat with, lots of different balls. And those variables should be available in their self-contained class so that they know what they can choose from. So universal design for learning is much more than just the equipment and the rules and instruction. It's, it's the whole way that you set up and approach a lesson. And so there's a book, imagine that, it's called Universal Design for Learning in Physical Education because universal design for learning is multiple means of engagement, multiple means of it's here, thank you, representation and multiple means of action and expression. And what we need to do is make sure that the teacher accesses all of these ways of instruction. So for example, engagement is stimulating the student's interest and motivation to learn. So what motivates all the kids and especially kids with CHARD syndrome to get up and be active? Is it a certain kind of music? Is it lights? Is it a sound that they, are interested in. I have some kids that will that will just get up and run across the room for a chew toy or a song on the on the uh, on the phone. And so some other examples are the equipment, giving the kids a range of equipment and modified rules and making sure that that the way that they that they motivate the kids is within their ability. So if they have no hearing, Maybe the music isn't going to be as motivating, so they might need something else. So what does motivate that child? 
And then principle number two is representation, which is the way the teacher provides the information. And so our kids could be visual learners, audio, audio learners. They might need to do it to be, to remember how to, to do it again. And they might need physical assistance and that is totally fine. And it's one of the things that I think people are reluctant to do is give the kids physical assistance, but they need that. And so we need to make sure that the teacher knows that they need to have a variety of teaching techniques in order to meet the needs of every child in the class, particularly the kids in the class with charge. I mean, if, if you go to Perkins and you see the deaf blind program, if you look at the gym in there, they have so many light up, auditory, bright, colorful, everything, equipment. They got, they have a big TV screen on the wall where they can make videos or countdowns and things like that. And that's motivating. Uh, and the last piece is how do you find out what the children know? And that's called multiple means of action and expression. And so basically this is the way you assess kids and find out what they know. And so if you're, if you're doing kicking, I was just at Perkins for a kicking unit and they had the kids either sit in their chair sit in a chair in the wheelchair or sit in a chair or stand or run to kick and every child got to show their kicking with a different type of ball different size the way they could kick and and if the teacher knows them well enough they'll know which variables to offer and so that's really important because there's not one size fits all and when, when you're talking about a heterogeneous class with kids with charge so that's that's like universal design for learning in a nutshell. I can share more about that, of course. Uh, but one one other good resource is called Games for People with Sensory Impairments. This is through the American Printing House for the Blind, and it's available free as a free download. This is for parents and physical education teachers, and basically, it is it's a adaptations to every pretty much every unit a teacher might be teaching, whether it's volleyball or soccer or football or aquatics, scooters. It gives a lot of different adaptations and variations. And again, that's a free download on the camp. We have it on our Camp Abilities website, campabilities.org. Oh, it says it right here on the, on the PowerPoint. And then there's also a book called Gross Motor Development Curriculum for Children with Visual Impairments. And this is also a free download on the APH website or the campabilities.org website under instructional materials. And it literally breaks down every locomotor and object control skill and tells you how to teach that. Because children who are deafblind take longer to teach these foundational skills. And so what we need to do is make sure that we know how to break down the skill and so for example, galloping, we use two paper plates and put some beans in them and have the child gallop and then their knee hits the plate and they can hear or feel those beans moving in the plate. So it gives them a reason to lift their knee up. And there's just tried and true adaptations in this, in this book, Gross Motor Development Curriculum. And then this one is called Physical Education and Sport for People with Visual Impairment and Deaf Blindness. Foundations of Instruction, it's basically a textbook that puts the fields of physical education and sport together with VI and deafblind, and it comes in one book, and I'm excited to say that we're working on the second edition, and it's in the editing process, so that's exciting that within the next year we'll have a new edition of this book as well, also through APH. The downside is that it's not on quota funds, so you have to pay for it, but that's okay. We can handle it. And then this book is called Strategies for Inclusion. This is through Human Kinetics. And again, this has a whole chapter on how to train the paraeducators, how to train peer tutors. There's a whole chapter on step-by-step -step related to placement. How do you place children with disabilities in adaptive physical education? And there's also how to dispel the myths and facts of physical education for children with disabilities. And again, we're in March, there's a new edition of this one coming out too from Human Kinetics. You can order it now though. Oh, and this is my most important thing to share to you is that 
kids with with charge don't have to dream about being active and doing something that's typical for their peers. They can do it. And this is this my friend Cora. She I hope you can hear this, what she says. And you skated really fast, didn't you? You skated really fast. Yeah, awesome. So Cora always wanted to ice skate and she always wanted to be independent. She'd see ice skaters and dreamed about it. And when she came to our program, she had the chance to not only skate, but skate better than she ever thought she would. And she was thrilled. She talked about it for weeks. And I just want to share that I don't think kids should just have to dream about being active and doing things their peers do. I want everyone to think that they can do it because it is possible to do. And so one of the ways we can do this, and I, I, I don't know how long this would take, but if, if everybody on here, can you put in the chat if, you, if your child has a paraeducator or an intervener? Just want to find out. Does your child have a paraeducator or an intervener? While folks are, are writing their answers, I uh, just wanted to draw your attention to the chat because I've been uh, putting all the links that Dr. Lieberman has been sharing throughout this presentation. And we will be sharing the slides and the recorded session afterwards. We, we had a, a question about that already. Thank you, Lily. These are great resources. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, one, one parent says that their son has a one-to-one one okay uh someone says yes their child has a a, a paraprofessional Someone says, my son's instructional assistant is taking the open hands, open access modules. Awesome. Oh, that's great. So there'll be a para and an intervener. Good. Yeah. And then um, three-fourths of my students have a para. Seven of them have an LNA educational assistant. That's okay. Awesome. I think that's the answer for most. I think most folks answered. Okay. Awesome. And I mean, we could talk all day about this, but when I was at a session last week, there were 90 teachers in my room and it was all on kids with moderate and severe disabilities. 90 teachers, two of them had time to train their paraeducators. Every single one of them wanted time to train their paraeducators. So especially with kids with as complicated as kids with charge, we really need to take the time to train the paraeducators and so there's a picture here of, of Dr. Beth and one of our support staff working one-to-one -one with her because that's the other thing is oftentimes it, even a one-to-one -one isn't enough, especially if you're in the pool with a child with charge syndrome. So you, you might have one person demonstrating within their vision and another person needing to physically assist them to do that activity. And so it's, it's you, they, we have to have that paraeducator in, in the room. And how do we do that? And so there's a lot of different materials out there. I mean, not a lot, but there's a lot of different materials training paraeducators for the classroom. But for physical education, there's this book, Paraeducators in Physical Education Through Human Kinetics. But we also have a video on our website, campabilities.org. It's called Staff Training, because I didn't just want to say paraeducators because it might be interveners. It might be teacher assistants. It might be peer tutors but it's called Staff Training in Physical Education, and that's on the campabilities.org website under instructional materials. It's so, so important that they know what to do every class. And even if you do little bits of training, we call it micro training before each unit, they at least know what you want them to do. And then, and again, like I said, in aquatics, 
it's really important that there's at least a one-to-one -one in aquatics. I mean, I've even had, you know, you have one person that's kind of swimming around engaging everybody and encouraging the kids because you could have a one-to-one, -one, but they might always be behind them, not being able to sign. And that's another issue is that you're, if you're in the pool, if the child needs an interpreter, an intervener, you probably have at least a two-to-one in the pool. And so swimming is a great medium to teach motor skills. You could do fitness in the pool. It's also very social. Of course, the kids can learn swim skills. And then they also learn self-determination. What do they like? What do they want? What can they do in the future? Which flotation device do I feel most comfortable? Which swim skills do I feel most comfortable? Who do I want to work with? They can actually make some choices and even ask for what they want. So one of the books that I encourage people to use is called Assessments and Activities for Teaching Swimming. This is through Human Kinetics and it's an ebook. It's adapted aquatics, basically. There aren't a lot of adapted aquatics books, actually. And then an aquatics resource, we want to we have a, a Lavelle grant right now, and this is our third year of the grant, but last year, everything was about swimming. We had a family conference with swimming and it was terrific. It was just amazing. And so we have this video that, that's on our website. And we also have tip sheets on flotation devices, positioning and transfers. And it all applies to our kids with charge. And then there are of course, typical sports that, that kids do after school and in the community that kids with charge can engage in. But you know, if your child has a more severe disability, there's even power soccer that can be played in a power chair. There's power hockey. This picture up in the top is called tabletop cricket, which is cricket for kids with, with and without disabilities. It's a, it's a sitting game of cricket. Of course, boccia is even played in the Paralympics, bocce, swimming sitting volleyball, and even archery, we can do from standing or sitting. So there are many sports that the kids can access. Oh, in the picture here, there's also biking on a tricycle or even recumbent bikes are possible. And then I, I just have to talk about self-advocacy because I don't think it's okay that, that somebody else is always speaking for the children. When they have a way to communicate, they should be asking for what they want when possible. So the self-advocacy, we, we wrote a book on self-advocacy, but also we're doing, we just developed a, a self-advocacy for physical activity questionnaire that we're validating. So there's four components of self-advocacy and we have to make sure that we teach self-advocacy in our classes to our students, to our children, so that they can ask for what they want on their own. Because you, you might not always have the parent there that knows what they need. You might not always have that intervener or the teacher there. The one constant variable is the child. If they go to a rock climbing birthday party, what do they need to be successful there? And so we also, on our website at Camp Abilities, we have a modification checklist so all the sports that we do at our camp is a checklist so the kids know what they need to be modified. And I hope that your physical education teachers are teaching this because when a child's doing, let's say tennis and they use a modified racket and maybe they use a different ball and they serve from a little closer to the net and are successful, if somebody doesn't know that they might unintentionally give them the wrong equipment and make them stand at the baseline and then they feel frustrated because they know that they can be successful with some variations. And so if we can get teachers to tell the kids what their, what their modifications are, then they can ask for that later when they get out there. And a book that promotes teaching self-advocacy through physical education and health is called Infusing Self-Advocacy into physical education and health. This is through Jones and Bartlett Publishers. And it's a great resource for teachers. And we're trying to do, well, there, there's a, a version on our website that's free. 
and it's for kids with visual impairments. And it's, it's a really great walkthrough of the components of self-advocacy and the five steps to self-advocacy. And we also have a video of kids with visual impairments talking about self-advocacy on our website. And then just some more resources again on our campabilities.org. I'll, I'll show you with this balance video. There's the paraeducator training video, motor development instruction, instructional video, and many, many other resources that I'll share with you. We also ha have tip sheets because the Lavelle grant is children with visual impairment and, and so the charge tip sheet is on there and that was written by the teachers at Perkins School for the Blind. And then also just wanna promote the Camp Abilities is a, an educational sports camp for children with visual impairments or deaf blindness. We have Camp Abilities, and I see people are from California. We do have one in Boston for the people from, from New Hampshire. Oregon, there's Camp Spark. And in North Carolina, there is a camp for kids. It's an outdoor camp for kids with visual impairment. And so I think that was where people were from. So you can look on our Camp Abilities website under other camps, and you can see where the other camps are, maybe one near you, hopefully. And then just had to throw out there, this is a new book I, I have. It's called The Camp Ability Story about, about my journey into creating camp abilities and working with kids with who are deaf blind. And then I had to put in this plug for a study that we're doing and it's for, and I see some of your kids are within this age span. It's for children between 10 to 18 years old and they just have to have the ability to communicate. And it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And if you can email me, I can email you the link to the barriers questionnaire. And it's just gonna help us understand the barriers to physical activity for children with charge syndrome. If that would, if you would be so kind to do that. And so I know that was a lot of information, but uh, just wanted to open it up now if anybody has any questions. All right, thank you so much. This was such amazing information. I'm sure that everyone is just soaking in all of these wonderful resources. This was, I, yeah. Wait, I just wanted to, can I just um, show you, sorry, the, I wanted to bring you to, I have to get, in the slideshow. Okay. I want to show you the Camp Abilities website and then under instructional materials, if you go under instructional materials, you'll see all these amazing videos. And these are all different sports that for physical education, like beat baseball, volleyball, tennis. Oh. This is Do you want to be sharing your screen right now? Oh, sorry. I'm not sharing my yeah, screen. No, that's okay. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, good. There you go. So it's but baseball, volleyball, tennis, soccer, basketball, track and field, cross country, aquatics, and wrestling. And those are just videos on visual impairment and deafblind, how to include kids with those disabilities. This one is called I Feel Included When. It's kids with visual impairments talking about what they need to be included. This one is on balance, teaching kids with charge syndrome, specifically balance. We called it got balance. And then here's the staff training video to teach the paraeducators. This one's a motor development video. This one is on the expanded core curriculum and how, how physical activity and physical education promotes the expanded core curriculum. This one, I just have to show you a minute of this one. This is so cute. This is uh, Kids with Charge. I've been in the- I'm gonna just get past myself. Oh, 
but just kids with charge syndrome just showing us all the different locomotor object control skills that people think they can't do. I just want to show you a little bit of that because that always makes me happy when I when I see that video. And then I just want to take you down here. Th this video on the right, it's called Foundational Skills for Children with Visual Impairments and Additional Disabilities. It's kids with who are have more severe disabilities doing kicking, running, hopping, jumping, throwing, all those skills. And then here is an aquatics video, kids with multiple and severe disabilities doing aquatics. And then we have a whole series of outdoor adventure videos here, paddle boarding, rock climbing, kayaking, fishing, biking, hiking, and how kids with visual impairments and deaf blindness can access all of those different activities. And then again, we have these books of free downloads, all of these tip sheets that are, are free to you. And please share these with your colleagues and, and friends and people on the multidisciplinary team. Okay, now I think we're good. Okay, let's see. Uh, Kathleen, I see that you have your hand raised. Do you, do you have a question? I'm going to click allow to talk. So if you want to ask your question, you can. Okay, it might have been an accident. So I'm just going to lower the hand, but if that was not an accident, feel free, free to put your hand back up. All right. So what, what questions do you all have uh, based on the resources that were shared, um, questions that you have maybe related to your own child or students that you're supporting? Maybe I'll start with the question while, while folks are, are typing theirs out. Um, I'm curious as to, so for, for parents who are on here tonight, how what do you recommend when you're consulting with families where school teams are not as knowledgeable as, as you and your team are on the importance of this and uh, especially how, how to know what resources to share, because you shared so many great resources. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, at what advice do you give to families as a place to start with getting school teams a little bit more bought in to all of this really, this really wonderful and important work? Yeah, that's a great question, Lily. I, to me, I feel like you have to know what you want first. And I know some of my friends who are parents of kids with charge are, are like, there are a lot of battles to fight and physical education is a direct service. And so whether you're fighting for their placement or them to have a paraeducator, they should be in physical education, one. And the other thing I think is important is that talk to people about what's going on before you go to the IEP meeting, because you don't wanna take people by surprise if you're gonna advocate for an inclusive setting 
when the child's in a self-contained setting. You need to plant that seed and explain why and talk to the people on the multidisciplinary team first. Does that make sense? Because you well, you don't want to blindside people. And the other thing is a lot of physical education teachers, they don't get information about kids who are deafblind at all in, in their intro to PE class, intro to adaptive PE class. But they also are not going to learn about kids with charge unless they take some children physical education for children with sensory impairment class. And so you have to tread lightly because everybody's doing their best. And if you have to come in and bring in a specialist or show them a video, it's like we as specialists and parents are going to have to do some of the training about the needs of the kids. But if you know that you want your placement changed or you want them to access a, a more rigorous curriculum, you're going to have to tell them ahead of time in private, not in front of people, because I can see people being very reactionary. And also, if they don't know what equipment they can get, I think they also might need some help with that. I was muted. Uh, that that's a a great response. I think that that's helpful to think through how to get that ball rolling and some specific strategies mm -hmm. for that. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, how often can a student get adaptive PE? My son only gets it once per month. So each each state has mandated minutes for different ages. So for example. In New York State, it's 120 minutes a week for children for all for children elementary for elementary age. So it goes down as the kids get older. But so and and okay, let me just tell you, adapted physical education is the umbrella term. So if a child qualifies for adaptive PE, they can receive it in any of those placements that I talked about. But your child needs to be getting physical education minutes equal to their peers. Now, most states are not meeting the mandated minutes. It's just is. I mean, people are trying. And so what you need to do is find out how many minutes they have a physical education altogether. And if they're not getting what's mandated by the state, then you can fight for more minutes in physical education. Does that make sense? And so once a month sounds to me like they're not anywhere near, unless it's like they're a senior and they just do some, uh, transition for planning or something like that. Does that answer your question? They say, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Call, you email me if there's a problem because uh, I can help. <laughs> so you, you had mentioned uh, kind of adaptive equipment. And I'm I'm curious. Do you ever work with families wh who are getting pushback from schools, saying they don't have funding for adaptive equipment, uh, or maybe parents themselves want to get that type of equipment for their children at home? Um, any resources that you typically recommend for supporting through that? Yeah, I mean the the school. The, the thing is, most of our kids don't need like very complicated equipment for physical education, maybe a softer ball or a brighter ball. They might need the, like a hockey stick to have, you know, like a built up on the grip that, that OT could help with that, those kind of things. But there's no excuse not to have variations because you, universal design is for everyone. And so if you're going to use the therapy ball for kids with charge to, to kick, cause it's, it gives them more feedback. It moves slower. They can actually touch it before they kick it and get that feedback. More kids than just kids with charge are going to need that piece of equipment. But the other thing is I hate to promote Amazon because we work with equipment companies like Sport Time, Gopher, US Games, but they're really expensive. You could get the same thing on Amazon for not that expensive. And the other thing is that you can also go to the PTA, you could go to local Lions clubs, and you say, I have a child that has a unique need in my physical education class. I need a variety of equipment. You're going to, you're going to get it. I mean, my Lions club, I'm in, I'm in the local Lions club. We would give it to somebody if they came and asked for it. But in most cases, the variation in equipment is something that you should have anyway 
through your universally designed class. So if you have different size hockey sticks, maybe you use a Frisbee for a puck instead of a little puck or a little ball, that, that's, not, that's not that difficult to do. Those are such, such good suggestions and show that if we're thinking creatively and just adaptively about the the, the way that we're doing uh, recreational activities, there's so much that we can do that doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Exactly. Yeah. I also wanted to um, use this as a time to, to plug the um, Ethan Wolf Recreational Assistance Program um, or ERAP, uh, which is through the, the Charge Center Foundation, uh, it's one of our family assistance programs where you can apply for funding to uh, support some of the costs of different recreational equipment, such as adaptive bikes and, and whatnot. So just put the link to that in the chat too. Thanks, Silly. One other thing I wanted to bring up that you were talking about too is teachers might use equipment as an excuse to marginalize or exclude kids with charge because they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to get hurt with maybe the traditional equipment and they say they can't get this modified equipment. But I want to talk about the dignity of risk for a minute. Dignity of risk. Now, physical education is a dynamic environment. Kids get hurt all the time. The teachers do what they can to make sure kids don't get hurt. And so we inadvertently will take away a child's choice. You know, when you play basketball, sometimes the ball might come down and hit you in the head or you might, it might whack you. If you're playing hockey, you might get hit with a stick. It happens. And so it is an inherent risk you take in physical education anyway. And with proper precautions, kids with charge can be successfully included in physical education and we have to give them that choice. Now we might give them a choice of rules, give them a choice of equipment that's within reason. So let's just say a child is at risk for a retinal detachment. Of course, we're not gonna use a regular basketball and play five on five competitive basketball, but we have to give that child the opportunity to try that sport in a safe way so that they can have the dignity of risk, the same as their peers have gotten. And too many times I find that we take that away from kids and they don't get that choice because that's not human, that's not dignified. And we have to respect their choices and give them that option so that they practice that when they grow up so that they aren't isolated and all by themselves, which is often what happens in my research. I did research on young adults who are deaf blind and they didn't have recreation discussions during their IEP or their transition plan meeting. And they are isolated and lonely because they don't know how to do typical things that their age group was doing in the community. I mean, I've ha I had parents crying when I was interviewing their young adults because they realized how marginalized they became and because they didn't have any of these opportunities. I think that's such an important point, especially with our um, our kids with charge. We know that there's a lot of time spent on just trying to keep them alive and keep them medically stable, and so it can it can be understandable that there's that that worry from the parent side too. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's such a good point of letting them be kids and letting them be able to do the things that that kids are doing and have some of the risks that's coming with mm -hmm. that. I really like that. Yeah, and I and I do see the need for parents to understand the genetic makeup and mm -hmm. and the medical issues related to their child. But what I what I want the parent to look at is your child's alive. Mm -hmm. How are they going to access the world? And what are they going to talk about? Where are they going to walk to? How are we going to give them a rich life full of meaning when once they do get all the their medical issues under control? And I just think it's there's aha moments when they're at a party and they start talking about their child went swimming and they didn't have to talk about surgery after surgery and hospitalizations and missing school and making it up. And wow, I got to talk about something that was that the, their friends were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's so powerful. And 
people really underestimate the importance of recreation and 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 sports. Uh, and when when you're making priority lists, it can be easy for that to get dropped and dropped. And this is a really helpful uh, reminder that it is really important and it should be prioritized as well. Well, it's it is funny that you say that because and and I know that our our colleagues will admit this that the first volume of the charge manual didn't have physical education or sport or mm-hmm. recreation motor skills and and I think us you know, pounding the pavement banging on their door presenting at conferences I feel like they see the value and how important it is now and now they they ask us every time they're doing a new version of anything to to contribute because again you know you you're if your child's working on swallowing they're working on their digestion they're working on their balance but all that's for nothing if the child lives and they have nothing to live for. And I think that's really important to keep in mind is who are they going to be in the world and what are they going to want to do and who are they going to meet? Mm-hmm. And that that can happen when they get, have a reason to be in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so important. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, do you ever uh, do any collaboration with medical providers or do you recommend that families will maybe get a a letter from their medical provider in terms of what is medically safe to do? Like, is, is there any sort of collaboration there that you typically recommend? Oh, that's a great question because in order for kids to be cleared for physical education, they have to have that permission. Sometimes there might be a limitation on like jumping or objects flying occasionally, like if they have some kind of medical concern, because, you know, some of the kids might have the, the heart defect and they might have ear issues. And so they might need to, to have some precautions, but, but usually like I actually made a form that you bring to the doctor to say, here's the unit we're working on. Here's the variations we're going to have. Please sign off on this. That's amazing. Yeah. Cause I, I, I was just thinking, and again, this is outside of my typical scope, but I was wondering if it also goes both ways of are there doctors out there who or medical doctors out there who are saying that a child is it's not medically safe to be participating in, in any sort of these like physical education activities. Oh, they do it all the time, even for just basic like epilepsy. Yeah. Even a child's a visually impaired, not no other disability, visually impaired, they're not going to lose any more sight. They're blind they'll still give them a medical excuse because they don't know. And mm-hmm. I actually, at the DBI Deafblind International Conference, I met this whole group of, of physicians that meet once a month and I they let me speak at their group and talk about the importance of physical education and not giving them a blanket medical excuse because it is so important for their self-determination and their quality of life to be in physical education. But especially older physicians don't know Mm-hmm. the universally designed lessons and all the variations that we can do all the modified equipment that we have now it's mm-hmm. not only possible it's impossible not to be involved mm-hmm. and i think that if a parent gets that blanket medical excuse pt is not allowed to replace physical education mm-hmm. according to the law mm-hmm. a related service can't replace a direct service they can come in, they can push in and help with your positioning. They can help you with modifications, rule variations, and they can give you advice, but they can't pull out. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the, what the law says. But unfortunately, and it's a problem. Parent, a lot of parents don't know this. So we actually made a, there's a checklist we made for parents that you bring to physical education. And these are all the things that you would bring with you, the questions you ask, And so it's called the IEP physical education checklist. I can send that to you, Lily, if I can Mm -hmm. find it. Yeah, I'm just looking it up online too. Yeah, so we actually validated that with parents of kids with visual impairment. And so that helps give the parents the tools when they go to a meeting to not get stepped on. I, I actually have had to go to meetings with parents, zoom in or go to the meeting because the school just thinks that they can have PT instead of that the school thinks they can have PT instead of mm. uh, of of uh, physical education, mm-hmm. but that but that's not the case. 
Gotcha. Um, we did just have one um one chat come question come through. I know that we are a little past time. Would you rather me uh copy it and email it to you, Lauren? No, no, I, I I'll I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do this last one. Uh, thank you so much for for being willing to sit, stay on it for a few more minutes. Uh, the question is, do you have recommendations or resources for adapted climbing gear, um, such as harnesses that are more supportive, as well as maybe a pull-up bar to ascend rather than climbing with legs? Our district does a really cool climbing unit, and it has not yet been made available to, for some students who use wheelchairs. I just started in the district, and they're open to purchasing adapted harnesses with pulley systems, etc., that might be compatible with the current system but having a hard time finding equipment. Yeah, there are full body climbing. There are full body climbing mechanisms. We have one and they're adjustable, like the straps are adjustable and it really does support the child. So if they can just reach up a little bit, they, they, the, the layer just pulls them up. And I don't know where to get it because somebody got it for us. But you can you can look up adapted climbing gear or full body climbing rock climbing equipment and uh, and we've even had people climb up next to them to sign to them to give them communication during the during the climb that's awesome i just found um a website that seems to have what you're describing so i just put that in the chat that reminds me lily great point challenged athletes foundation they do give equipment to people with disabilities, they it's it's a they only give it to individuals. They give adapted bikes. They give adapted equipment. So if you want something for the child to use in physical education, they can write a grant. They give you usually up to fifteen hundred dollars. It's a wonderful organization, Challenged Athletes Foundation. Awesome, very cool. And then I just I'm finding one more. Uh, okay, there we go. Just found Move United. I don't know if you've heard of. Mm -hmm. them but um okay well this was such a wonderful presentation thank you so much lauren for for coming and sharing your wealth of knowledge with with, with us um, I'm, I'm sure that people are going to be really utilizing a lot of these resources um and thank you everyone for coming today um we we're not going to have an ask the expert in december but we should be back in january so keep an eye out for for our next session Thank you, Lily. And thanks everybody for coming. Please email me if you have any questions or you need any help with your schools or school districts because uh, your kids deserve the best. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you for our interpreters for doing a wonderful job for us tonight too. Yes. Thank you, interpreters. <laughs> All right, Lourdes, you can stop the recording now.